Thank you so much and good morning. Pleasure to uh, be here and all of you have really proven enormous stamina uh, as we are now nearing uh, the end. So welcome uh, to this uh, session on identifying factors that support or hinder the scaling up of uh, promising uh, new ventures. Um, I think as many of you know, this is a key issue in uh, Europe. Um, for a long time, the policy uh, making focused very much on fostering, stimulating entrepreneurship. Um, and, uh, but I don't think that was really, that is an issue, but not only, because if you look at the actual figures, roughly 15% of Europeans are self-employed. It's uh, more or less the same um, as in the United States, if not a little bit higher. So we have a lot of people who are willing uh, to start companies, to go it on their own, and who are willing to take a risk. So what's the issue? Um, the issue is uh, around this ability to scale up. Uh, so if you look at Europe, we tend to have a disproportionate uh, number of um, static firms. Um, so these are firms that don't really grow, but they also um, don't really leave the market, even though they are not highly performing. Um, and um, most of them are certainly not uh, what was yesterday, I think, uh, referred to as uh, frontier firms. Um, so. Um, so they are slow to um, adopt new technologies, um, they tend to be slow to internationalize, and uh, they tend to not be really at the cutting edge of uh, innovation. Um, this is uh, creating a number of uh, problems in the European economy. Um, I recommend some interesting work that the OECD is doing on the link uh, between productivity and inequality, uh, which uh, I think uh, warrants more attention. But in fairness to the companies, I think policy making has um, at okay, on occasion also actually incentivized uh, firms to stay small. It was Peter Pratt, uh, the chief economist of um, uh, the ECB, who yesterday spoke about um, once a company reaches um, 50 employees in many uh, EU member states, they need to start introducing works council, um, et cetera. And so what this has led to, particularly in Italy and France, is a large, large number of, um, of small firms uh, that somehow miraculously stop growing when they reach uh, 49 uh, employees. Um, but we also, um, I would say, have in Europe a much stronger emphasis on incumbents. Um, I challenge you to name uh, many uh, very large international companies that have uh, come, uh, come up here in Europe in the last uh, two to three decades. I personally can think only of SAP. And uh, that's certainly very different um, if you compare that to other parts of uh, the, the world. Um, but we also, I think, see that many European founders actually tend to sell their companies quite early. So uh, American companies are always very active coming to Europe and buying up uh, the, new, uh, the new very promising young firms. Uh, but increasingly, we're also seeing that the Chinese are scouting in Europe and buying up uh, young companies. Um, so um, this phenomenon of not being able or willing to scale up, I think, is, is very real. And I look forward to discussing this very important uh, uh, issue with a, a very distinguished panel that I'm sure has many more insights uh, to offer. And with that, let me immediately go to Stefan uh, Neugebauer from uh, BMW. He already spoke um, yesterday in intervened in one of the sessions. But uh, Stefan is here as because he serves as chairman of the European Road Transport Research um, Advisory uh, Council. And I think um, it was already mentioned several times in the discussion um, at this conference that this is really a very critical moment for European car makers. You know that this is a very, very important part of our economy. Uh, but as you said yesterday, Stefan, a lot of the value now is not just in the car itself, but it's actually in the in the digital technologies that are in the car. It's how it interacts, uh, the, inter the connectivity. So, you know, you'll certainly have much to say about this topic and I'll take it, uh, give it over to you now. Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you for inviting an engineer to this innovation panel. Um, and thank you for inviting somebody from the automotive industry. Why? because the automotive industry is the most innovative sector in Europe. 
we are spending 40 billion euros each year for research and innovation, more than any other sector. So automotive industry is the most innovative sector in Europe. And we are um, responsible for more than 12 million jobs, 12 million jobs in Europe. Yesterday, you voted for the deconstruction of your industrial sectors. And most of you said, yes, deconstruction is very important. I completely disagree. I completely disagree. In my point of view, for automotive industry, we should keep this heart of European economy. We should keep it, and we should improve this by innovation. So deconstruction is, for me, not the right word. Maybe we should think about reconstruction, and reconstruction by innovation. And we need this technical innovation because we are challenged by decarbonization to avoid CO2 emissions and by the digitalization. And when you look at the targets for transport, for decarbonization, then it's absolutely clear then that this can only be solved by a system approach. This means not only better vehicles, of course, better vehicles, but also a better traffic system, better traffic management, better logistics, and to avoid traffic. And here, digitalization can really help. And in our point of view, digitalization will be a boost, will be a boost for jobs and growth in Europe. When you are thinking about what is needed for digitalization, these are not only the sensors and the vehicles, but the sensors will be produced by highly uh, um, technology companies in Europe with a lot of jobs. We need the sensors, we need the infrastructures, the roads, the traffic signs, we need the software, we need the telecommunication, we need the data exchange, we need all these things. So the old-fashioned the, the old segment, road transport, could be a real boost for jobs and growth in Europe. And we need a lot of research for this area. How can we organize this research? In Europe, we have a very good tool for this. It brings together all the different stakeholders. And the stakeholders are the startups, the university, the research makers, the um, supply industry, the OEMs, the car manufacturers, the infrastructures, the SMEs. All these are the different partners. And they are coming together by public funded pre-competitive research. Public funded pre-competitive research. So there are some people uh, today in the European arena, in Brussels arena, they think, oh, we are spending money for this industry and automotive industry, they are earning so much money. Uh, why should we spend money for them? We should kick them out from the funding. Yes, you can do this, but then industry is out. Why? Because no, pub, no private company will spend money in a pre-competitive public research project where the results are completely published. So if you want to kick out industry, then you should do this. But then you destroy the ecosystem, the ecosystem for boosting innovation in our, for our society. Therefore, we need to keep this and we need to keep also the funding for industrial partners because they have to do the dissemination, they have to do the uh, market uh, introduction. So we have a very successful European contractual public-private partnership. It's the European Green Vehicle Initiative. We did this, um, it started 10 years, more than 10 years ago, uh, dealing with electromobility. It was very successful, very successful. And in our point of view, we should go on 
by creating another public-private partnership which is dealing with digital di digitalization of road transport. If we do so, we bring together the stakeholders, the researchers, the universities, the industry, and we can create the next level of technology and we can create jobs and growth. Thank you. Stefan, thank you so much. I think this was very important to explain the sort of interplay between what private companies do and public authorities, uh, because they will have to deliver on a lot of what you are talking about, not just in helping to fund this, but also in creating the infrastructure that you talked about. So I think uh, very, very interesting what you, what you had to say. Now next up is uh, Jose uh, Pozo, uh, Director of Technology and Innovation at the European Photonics Industry uh, Consortium. This is an area where Europe has actually, I think, uh, quite a few very promising companies. I'm sure you will tell us about that. And uh, we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Anne. And first of all, thank you for the European Central Bank for inviting me. It is an honor to be here today. As Anne said, I'm the CTO of EPIC, the European Photonics Industry Consortium. We have 306 members, most of them, 90% of them in Europe. And one of the things that we do is to promote photonics and to make sure people understand that photonics will make a big difference in, in the way that we see the world, in the way that we use the world, in the way that we interact with the world. So yesterday I was here and I had a, a really nice experience talking to all of you. And many of you actually asked me, what is photonics? So today, I have to admit, in the previous coffee break, I, I prepared this slide quickly to let you know what photonics is. And photonics is, most of you have heard about what lasers are, lenses, mirrors, LEDs, solar panels, but what can you actually do with that? So I summarize it in three families. With photonics, you can make things. A lot of people have heard of 3D printing. We have heard from BMW, laser-based manufacturing is a big thing in Germany, where you can actually construct almost everything using light. But in addition, you can sense things you can actually not only sense a weapon in, in a carriage bar, but you can also sense cancer in tissue. And you can also communicate things, and that's what everybody knows about. The optical fiber communication has revolutionized the world, and now you can watch Netflix in 4K in your computer. Really fantastic things that you can do with photonics. But when you look at the EPIC network, at the 306 companies that form EPIC, you realize that for a technology in which, and you are totally right, Europe, in many of these fields is leading, is leading. You look at the companies, and 60% of those companies have less than 20 employees. And when I talk to them, because one of the things, my job really is to talk to these companies and to understand what are their bottlenecks and to how to connect them, how to, how to help them in this association, they all tell me, we are scared to grow, because most of the things that Anna has mentioned, but also we are really at the valley of death. We have great IP, we are trying to scale up, we are trying to find the tools, and it's very difficult for us to find those tools that can allow us to go to the volume manufacturing, to go to satisfy the demands of all our customers. We have a few products in the market, we are surviving, but we have the ideas to grow, but we don't have, we, we lack the means, the tools to go to that volume manufacturing. So I was very impressed by the, the presentation of Professor Berger. That was really nice. You said that the, in, the, in MIT and in the US, there are these innovation centers for, for manufacturing. And then you said that uh, in Europe, there is this French uh, organizations that are doing something. Uh, in Europe, we do have also innovation centers for manufacturing. Uh, European Commission has put lots of money on this, around 100 million euros, to set up pilot lines for the production of many different technologies, among one of them, photonics. Five years ago, the European Commission, together with Photonics 21, uh, uh, allowed photonics to be one of the six key enabling technologies. Other ones were nanotechnologies, biotech, advanced materials, micro nanotechnologies, and advanced manufacturing. And when they said photonics a key enabling technology, we want the companies who develop photonic devices to enable this production. And we're gonna set these pilot lines for deploying this technology. And all the things, and you have here four examples, Pix for Life, PiScale, Mirfab, Pixab, those are pilot lines that today 
the set a dis distribution share of facilities and companies can go to them and can actually manufacture their technology. The, each of them uh, focus on different technologies. For example, Pix for Life does biosensors, PyScale does OLED, Mirfa focuses on chemical sensors, and Pixab does packaging of silicon photonics. I think many of you actually have heard of silicon photonics since you are working very close to MIT and Silicon Valley. Is it okay for me to take a poll? How many of you have heard of the word silicon photonics? So I count, for the camera, I am counting five to 10%. Silicon photonics is one of these technologies that is gonna revolutionize the way that data is used in data centers. They are gonna increase the capacity of data centers by one or two orders of magnitude. They are gonna allow the companies that have been mentioned in this, uh, in this forum in the previous uh, panels, like this Google, Facebook, Apple, they're going to allow to have lots and lots of more data processing in these data centers. But there is one problem, which is that the silicon photonics IP, a, a, a lot of it is in Europe. So Europe has the key to enable this huge step by silicon photonics. So to conclude my presentation, I think I still have one minute, I want to tell you a tale, the tale of a photonics company, which I'm gonna call Photonics Company X. Photonics Company X have amazing ideas and great IP. They actually do the patent with the patent uh, office. They did a great patent on something in photonics. I'm gonna call it silicon photonics, right? Uh, something in silicon photonics. The IP was actually acquired through EC, European Commission funded projects in the FP7, Horizon 2020 programs, projects funded by the money from taxpayers, European taxpayers. And this IP has actually made this company do some business analytics, uh, do some business, mod, uh, business plan, and uh, with the help of lots of consultants in the audience, they managed to go uh, to get this business plan and say, we have to go to the market. So they started, uh, it took maybe four days to, to two months, as it was said in the previous presentation, but they started Company X. How does this beautiful story end? Well, I'm gonna tell you about different outcomes. The worst outcome I'm not gonna mention, the company disappears, I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say the happy endings and the not so happy endings. The first outcome, the company is rapidly acquired by US company Y or Chinese company Z. I think maybe you already know who Y and Z are. And yeah, for me that's a really, really not so happy ending. Very happy for the, for the company who developed company X, but not for the taxpayers, not for the European Commission, not for the money, the effort from the European universities to develop silicon photonics to the point of be leading, leading the world right now. Let's focus on a different outcome. The company says, we are not gonna sell, we are gonna go fabless. We don't want to make our own manufacturing, we are gonna try to find other companies who do the manufacturing of our IP and try to negotiate their IP. Two possibilities, they are part of a European ecosystem, yes. That's fantastic, that's what we want to do, that's what we want to promote. Help the companies help each other. This company, Company X, finds companies in the surroundings, maybe not geographically located, but in a clear ecosystem that can help them do the manufacturing. They subcontract manufacturing to another ecosystem, to another company, to a maybe CMOS platform in China. Again, we lose the IP. Again, we lose the market. Again, manufacturing is not done in Europe. Not so happy. <coughs> and the final one, and it's the one that I think we need to focus. We want companies to scale up, to ramp up. We need to help them set up the facilities to do their own manufacturing. Maybe share those facilities, maybe do these pilot lines funded by the European Commission, but we have to help them. And that's, I think, if we leave this room with some clear statements on how we can help the companies grow into the point that they can do their own manufacturing, then we can say that we did a great job these days. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thought that was extremely interesting because what it proves is, I mean, so much of our discussion is around technology. I find that that's not necessarily our weak spot. It is much more about helping companies um, to stay here, to do their business here. So it's a large, around the larger framework conditions for companies, which is not oftentimes, um, uh, not often enough mentioned 
in relation to, to innovation. Um, being scared to grow is for me uh, something very worrisome on the policy making side. So thank you for sharing that. It's also, by the way, the perfect segue to our next speaker, who is um, Deborah Revoltella, uh, the um, director of the economic department and uh, at the European Investment Bank. Deborah has done for many years very important, insightful research into what we are all discussing here today. So it'll be a pleasure to listen to you. Deborah, over to you. Thank you very much. I feel I'm going back to the discussion that unfortunately I missed yesterday because I'm going to be more on the economist side discussing, but I hope still uh, to be able uh, to bring uh, some interesting uh, point into the debate. And uh, the angle that I take, as I was saying, I, I'm an economist and working uh, um, on different topics, including investment activities, because I work also in the European Investment Bank uh, that is actually quite relevant uh, for uh, whatever we are discussing. Last year, uh, it's a European institution for the non-Europeans, it's a European institution funded uh, by the 28 member states of the European Union. Uh, we are supporting investment, and last year we were financing uh, some 15 billion investments uh, in innovation, uh, 80 billion overall, uh, and uh, we are the largest venture capital in Europe, uh, taken at large. We invest in fund of funds, but at the end uh, we have a quite a strong uh, rule. So um, what I'm going to present is basically uh, some uh, hints uh, that come from a very recent uh, study. We that actually will be presented in two weeks' time. And the study is uh, looking at, uh, so we have interviewed 12,500 firms in Europe, uh, being a representative of all countries, all size of firms, etc. And we have a lot of insight on what is hindering. The whole survey is focusing on investment, what is constraining investment, what are the priorities of investment, and different kind of investment per, fir per firm, and also what are the constraints to investment activities that come from various uh, elements. And I think uh, what is interesting, I skip this because I have much less time than I saw, so I will skip a few of the slides. I think the overall environment is very important. We are talking about Europe that is coming out from a very strong crisis. On investment point of view, you have a recovery, but it's very much uneven among countries. And still today, we have investment that at the European level is some 8% below the pre-crisis level. So that's the context where we are living in. In terms of uh, business investment, uh, we see that uh, there is a recovery now. Actually, we are in a positive phase of uh, the investment cycle. But uh, what you see is that the firm are really complaining on the quality, it's a, not an economic really term, uh, but on the quality of their capital. So they are not concerned on the fact uh, that they didn't invest enough because uh, they now feel that they don't have enough uh, production capacity. But they are feeling that the quality of their capital is not what could have been. They feel that technology is not a state of the art. Some 50% of firms say they have equipment that is a state of the art. Also in terms of climate efficiency, there are gaps in terms of the quality structure of capital. And in line with these, the uh, firms are mostly thinking uh, for the future in investing into replacement and also in uh, new product and services. So that is a very interesting uh, point. Um, but uh, on product and services, I will say something uh, uh, more going on. Uh, again, in terms of uh, impediments, uh, firms uh, think that uncertainty, and that's uh, we hear from everywhere, where is the main impediment uh, to investments. But uh, there are other important elements uh, where, which I wanted to detail a little bit more going forward. Uh, one is uh, the availability of skills, and the other two are labor and business regulations. I think in Europe we talk a lot to do about th that we need to do more about it, but it's particularly relevant for new firm, young firms, and particularly relevant for more innovative firms to address things related to labor market and business regulation. And then we come to access to finance, where the claim of the firms, not my, my claim, is that this is an impediment, but only for some firms, particularly the young ones, maybe the innovative ones, but it's not the major issues. The other impediments are more relevant. I go quickly 
through some of the slides and I just uh, catch your attention to a few things. These are uh, European firms uh, and uh, their intention uh, to invest in the, 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 what, sorry, not the intention to invest, uh, what they have done. So investing uh, in uh, whether they were investing in new products uh, that are new to the company, new to the country, or uh, new in the global market. As you see, I think the, the last three parts are really the firms that are innovating in something new, and it's really an idea of innovation at large because it's a product, processes, etc. We ask something very wide, and you see that you have some 50% of the firms innovating, but mostly, and there is a lot of room still to go on that, is new to the company, new to the country. So in Europe, there is a lot of adoption of innovation. There are also leaders, some uh, firms, and according to countries you see the different dynamics, but a lot is still going on in through this, uh, um, this uh, adoption of technology and uh, upscaling, and it also fits very well with it's what I was saying before about the quality concern in terms of capital. Um, I go to the slide on impediments, and here basically we ask to all firms, and then I have some hints on what the young and innovative say, but this is the picture for all firms on uh, what are the key impediments. And you see that, uh, um, that uh, the first one, as I was saying, is uncertainty, and that's related to many different factors uh, that are uh, really also firm specific, country specific, um, and, um, and cycle, cycle specific other than structural, but, uh, but I forget this element for now. I wanted to concentrate on the other impediments, and uh, here I think uh, what emerged, and uh, when I saw the result I was quite surprised, is uh, for firms overall, one of the major constraints of investment is uh, this availability of skills. And here, uh, I think uh, that uh, if, you, uh, if you look only for the young firms, uh, you see uh, a statistically significant, uh, much higher probability that uh, the firms uh, that are younger, uh, they feel availability of skills also to be, um, to the, be a major obstacle. And uh, this is consistently true in almost all countries, in 10, 22 countries uh, um, out of uh, 28 uh, member states. And the issue of skills, I think, is something uh, where we have uh, to, um, to have uh, some uh, strong uh, policy response uh, on different point of view at uh, the European level. So the skill issue is an issue in uh, core Europe, uh, in, the, in Germany, in other countries uh, that you would expect uh, because uh, the, economic uh, the, the economic cycle is much stronger, etc. But it's also a very strong constraint in all Central Eastern European countries so where you had a lot of also brain drain in the last years, and, uh, and you have a lot of, uh, um, of, um, of constraint at the end for the firm dynamic. And uh, uh, I think uh, on the skills part, another element that I wanted to add, I think it's uh, extremely important to do something in terms of skills development also at the European level, because there is a component related to the inclusiveness of growth that we are not not really focusing. Here we are talking about competitive issue, but you can have a competitiveness associated to the inclusiveness of growth, and there are skill and skill development becomes uh, extremely important. Um, the other two barriers uh, that are quite relevant and are particularly relevant if you think at innovative uh, companies uh, is the uh, labor market uh, regulation and business uh, regulation. I think a uh, labor market uh, regulation, uh, the literature shows uh, that there are uh, that uh, f first the uh, young firms uh, tend also to, um, to, to be more affected. Uh, there are uh, scale issues, and I think uh, we find exactly the same thing, uh, a gap at uh, 50 on uh, growing firms. Uh, so the growth firms uh, can be really affected uh, by labor market regulation and business regulation. But I think uh, there is another element uh, that one has uh, to think about, uh, labor market regulation is also affecting uh, the propensity of firms uh, to invest in intangible, and I think it's uh, very much approved uh, by the literature. And business regulation uh, very much affects uh, the reallocation of uh, the resources in most cases, uh, where uh, coming out uh, from a crisis uh, that w like the one uh, that we have seen in Europe uh, is a very dangerous thing. You try to get the resources uh, blocked in the wrong areas, uh, and you don't have the necessary reallocation of resources. I just jump uh, quickly to 
almost the last thing because I'm using a lot of time. I was saying uh, finance is not the main constraint, but it's still a, a constraint for certain firms, and particularly the most innovative one. I think uh, what we clearly see is uh, that uh, there is uh, um, the most innovative, uh, I don't have it in the, in the, in the slide, uh, but uh, the most innovative firms uh, have uh, statistically proved uh, much higher probability of uh, having uh, internal financing uh, rather than in external financing, and that's uh, really coming uh, from, uh, um, from uh, the environment. Uh, we also see from the survey that uh, younger firms have uh, much more recourse uh, to loans from family and friends, a little bit more equity, but uh, they also tend to be more uh, finance uh, constraints. So at the end, uh, is not the major impediment, the finance part, but uh, there is uh, something to do in terms of uh, uh, finance. Um, if I can uh, just, uh, the last word on uh, what uh, the EIB group is doing on that uh, point of view, I was uh, saying at uh, the very beginning, uh, we are a European institution, we are uh, dedicated uh, to supporting investment activities, and uh, last year we were lending almost uh, 15 billion uh, directly to innovation projects. And among the other things, I think we are present in all uh, the scaling up phase of uh, financing of uh, innovation. Among the other things, I think one of the most uh, uh, relevant uh, success of what we, is, is what we are doing uh, is also related uh, to uh, the venture capital, uh, where in the period uh, 96 to 2014, uh, we were lending uh, almost 11 billion um, of uh, investment uh, in uh, venture capital as a fund of funds. And uh, what uh, we are uh, really keen on doing is uh, trying to demonstrate uh, that we are uh, a fund of the fund, uh, but we are catalyzing other investment. And I think uh, we have uh, quite uh, some good result uh, proving it. Thank you so much. I think that's uh, extremely important to have sort of uh, data f at the firm level and asking them what concretely are the bottlenecks. So, I mean, thank you for sharing that with us. I thought that was extremely, extremely interesting. So last but not least, uh, we now go to Vladimir Bulovic, uh, the co-director of the MIT Innovation Initiative and also the person who's responsible for this amazing new uh, nanotechnology uh, research center, which was already mentioned uh, last evening over dinner. Uh, Vladimir, great you can be with us, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to be as quick as I can, uh, telling you about how to redefine innovation for, from perspective of a startup. I think it's very important to recognize that as you do innovation, you're spending money. You're actually not generating value. The value is only once in a while going to be generated if that particular innovation can truly be scaled up. To get you to the place where you can scale up, that's a very important place to be. But the one thing we often miss is what's the journey from innovating the very first idea to actually reaching million people with that idea. So I'll ask very simple questions on how long does it take to actually innovate. And so let's take some very simple examples. At the beginning of the 20th century, a tremendous innovation came about. It was known as the zipper. Now, if you look at the zipper and you ask, how long should it take to make some small mechanical parts, string them together and use them as a zip? Well, it took about a dozen years, 12 years, roughly speaking, from the first idea to the ability to actually make a million boots that use the zipper. Why? Because the manufacturing process for making small parts that needed to be made precisely simply did not exist. It was a brand new innovation, it became much simpler once the foundry of making such small parts came about and anyone else can reproduce it. Let's move to the middle of the 20th century and look at a little more advanced innovation of Velcro. And again, how long did it take from the first idea to a million people using it, primarily popularized by the Apollo missions, but still it took about 13 years to figure out how to extrude the fibers, get the right kinds of Young's modulus and flexibility. And now that is all the things we now take for granted, right? Because the foundry of making those particular elements exists. And it's very easy to utilize for the next replica of a Velcro-like technology. But if I'm gonna invent an entirely new technology, how long will it take? So here is another one that you might have seen around in form of a cell phone that might have indeed a screen up on the front. 
The screen uh, that you typically look at will either be a liquid crystal or more recently organic light emitting device, also known as the OLED. How long did it take to make OLEDs from the first demonstration to actually a million OLEDs being used in form of cell phones? Well, about 25 years. <laughs> Why? Because we used an entirely different kind of a semiconductor known as molecular thin film. No one ever bothered figuring out how those work. It took a while. And once we actually had one pixel that worked really, really well, making a million pixels that all of them work just right, and all of them work with 100% yield, because it turns out us as users, we don't like to have displays that have bad pixels. You actually have, you have a yield of 99.999% in order to be able to make something you can sell. Well, that took 25 years, because no one knew how to actually put down semiconductors of that quality over large areas as needed to make actual displays. That's why OLEDs still come in a form of cell phones rather than large screen TVs. Those are available as well, but those are much more expensive. Well, so look at the journey of how to make a new idea, and let me simplify it. It takes, let's say, a decade. I'm simplifying it, right? It could be a little bit less or it could be a lot more, as you've seen. What happened before, as Suzanne Berger pointed to us before, is, well, it used to be that there would be a spark of innovation, maybe at university, maybe at some other innovation center, and then corporate labs would hear those ideas by listening to us give talks at conferences, reading our papers, and given the first three years at universities, next seven in corporate labs, you could finally be ready for production. At universities, we spent money. In a corporate lab's uh, development, we also spent money. So still, we didn't actually generate a profit from this investment. And hence, uh, thanks to the financial pressures, as a Pi study informed us, there's a new way to think about how to make money in such world, which spends all this money making new ideas. Why even focus on the green and blue areas there? Why not just look at the very last end of the process? And, Indeed, companies like Apple, the most successful technology company out there, looks at what is available and it comes up with clever ways of designing those particular elements into an existing technology. So who takes the middle slack part that corporate labs are not focusing on anymore? Well, that is where the startups are. And from perspective of universities, this is the most exciting place to launch our students into. As a matter of fact, the reason why we have students at universities is because we convince them that their job is to change the world. Well, how are they gonna change the world? They're gonna step into an entity that does someone else's work in years nine and 10 of production process. They can change the world by stepping into a startup, having it daring enough to be able to define their own vision of what the world should be, and then going ahead and implementing it. And you know, it takes naivete to do that, right? <laughs> Who in their right mind would choose the as much uh, 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 uncertainty to undertake as their job and career, the first one they're gonna step into. Because actually, if you look at the success of ideas, this is uh, back in 1997, but you can reproduce this study by others, and you'll find very quickly that out of 3,000 raw ideas, you might find, file a few of those as disclosed patents, and maybe 150 patent applications might even come out of that. But only one will actually yield a useful technology. Now, how come? <laughs> is it because all those other ideas are bad? Well, no. It's the support of the idea as it marches through the ecosystem of being actually developed into a useful thing. That actually starts killing off one idea after another until you finally do have a success you're gonna be able to share with others. All right, so how do I define then the next set of opportunities? Well, that's what MIT focuses on. Fiona Murray pointed to us that we study both the practice of innovation, guys like me who actually make technologies, but much more importantly, we focus on the science of innovation. Why is it that some technologies do so well, and why is it that others do not? Why is it that certain ecosystems are so effective in translating the next set of ideas, and why is it that others do not? Those are the rules of regulations that can then allow us to make simple choices and actually redefine the next set of technologies. So let me give you one example. So, this is a plot that uh, now our provost, Marty Schmidt, and our colleague, Alex Slocum, put together a little while ago. They were looking at things and saying, how much do things cost per pound, and what's the annual volume you're gonna have to you know, make them at to still make a viable product? 
So make big things like Boeing 777 or one of those huge tools that does silicon processing. They weigh a lot. They cost a lot per pound or per kilogram, those of us in Europe here. Um, but the annual volume is relatively low. Hamburgers, on the other hand, uh, cost very little per pound. And indeed, you make a lot of them. So let me imagine one day trying to make actually a transformative energy technology. Well, wait a second. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to make a lot of that technology. So I need to be at the cost per pound of a hamburger. So what would be a transformative energy technology? Well, how about uh, silicon solar cells? Well, the challenge with those is they are kind of heavy. So is there a way for me to redefine solar cells by using this graph? Well, yes. Why is silicon solar cell heavy? Actually, it turns out because a piece of glass that's holding it is very, very heavy. And you need it because silicon is brittle. You want to make sure it doesn't crack. Well, can I make a solar cell like this? This is a piece of paper painted with molecular semiconductors, same as one of those OLEDs, that can also act like a solar cell. But weighs, oh, it's only a fraction of what a silicon piece of glass, um, as to silicon with a piece of glass weighs. Why does this matter? Well, it might matter if indeed I want to reach that particular point of large production. Give me a lot of, <laughs> a lot, lot of production, but make sure the weight of this thing is not very much, so the cost is not very much. Because if I can have power in a form of such portable, lightweight, imperceptibly light solar cells, I might be able to put it on any surface I want in the developed world, but more importantly, I can actually make it affordable to have it be delivered in a developing world, where in India there are 600 million people without access to grid electricity, and they can't have it because it's a year's salary to buy one silicon solar panel. Bring down the weight and you'll bring down the cost and you'll be able to transform the lives of about one and a half billion people in the world. Very simple metric guided by the intuition that you can derive by asking what's the science of innovation, not the practice of innovation. Oh, go ahead, you know, make it even more ridiculously light. Here is a picture of a solar cell that is so light that you can put it on top of a soap bubble. It's about one 400th times as much as silicon weighs. And yes, it's imperceptibly light, and you know what? Use other kinds of nanoscale technologies and you can make it imperceptible. You can make solar cells that actually look like absolutely nothing. They look like a piece of glass because they do not absorb visible, but they do absorb infrared light. Well, would you ever use those? Well, yes, any surface you touch now can be solar active. Internet of Things can be real because it wouldn't require powering. This would provide its own power. If I give you a Kindle that is coated with such a solar cell, you will never have to recharge it again because the ambient light would go and provide you the power you need. Similarly, if I could cover a skyscraper like this one with such solar cells, about a quarter of the electricity of that skyscraper could be provided with today's transparent technology. Well, that's a transformative way of thinking of what opportunities are. And so when we think about scale up, we think about this. Our carriers of innovation are people. And this particular picture is actually taken from our largest auditorium. And what you're looking at is a few students presenting their final project in class called 2009 Product Engineering. This is what gets our students to come and see other people present things. If you want to get together 1,226 students, show them technology. That's what works at MIT. And the reason why it works is because our ecosystem is geared towards that. That's what you need to build to generate innovations. You want to have the enthusiasm and naivete that your job is to change the world. And you will actually do it. You'll guide yourself to the following, which is that about 31% of all of MIT alums are named as inventors of patents. And you can ask how many of them start companies. Out of 130,000 alums, about 30,000 of them, as Fiona found out with Ed Roberts as a co-author, that 30,000, 130,000 alums actually start companies. Add the value of those companies, and it comes out to about $1.9 trillion, or roughly equal to 10th largest economy in the world. <laughs> that's what innovation is about. And that's what could be done by generating a cluster of people excited enough to make the next step together.
Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm very glad also you spoke last because you again put everything a little bit into context. Uh, we're running out of time, but before I go to the floor, I want to have a brief exchange between Vladimir and uh, Stefan because what emerged in our preparatory discussion was what you were talking about, the breakthrough technologies. And Stefan made the point, well, in Europe, we're actually much better at incremental innovation, sort of improving a little bit at a time. And then, Vladimir, uh, tell, tell the group what you said in there, in one minute or less. <laughs> Um, you spend $1 on research, you spend $10 in development, and you spend $100 on production. That is the usual ratio of, of uh, what you need to cost spent out. So the moment you start doing production, you have committed yourself to where you need to go. There are two types of innovation, Stefan's way of innovation and my way of innovating. And I think those are absolutely both valid as a way of moving the world forward. The question is what uh, final output you want. Is it indeed to read trained to re redefine the world, or is it to improve the world beyond what he's seen before thanks to the existence of today's technology? They're both valid ways of advancing. And what did you say about Tesla? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was mentioning the fact that if batteries in Tesla happen to be one-tenth of the cost of what they are today, I'm not sure that we would have combustion engines. Okay. That would be a transformative way of changing a very different industry. This is the perfect segue to Stefan, because this will be existential for Europe. This is our key industry. What will happen to Germany if we get this wrong? Stefan, can you answer this in two minutes or less? I try to. I try to. Um, first of all, Tesla is a perfect example um, how taxes can help to introduce innovation to the market. When I'm thinking about uh, some uh, European countries uh, like Denmark, in Denmark Tesla is very successful. Why is it so successful? One reason is that a Tesla um, has a lot of benefits in taxes and therefore a Tesla which is a high-end luxury car costs more than a BMW 3 Series uh, I was responsible for. So you can imagine uh, taxes are impossible. But now this is changing. The second thing is uh, that the European uh, OEMs, the car manufacturers, uh, the f um, they have stakeholders uh, and they want to earn money. They want to earn money and the financial model of uh, Tesla uh, in the US is, is different from, from this. The third thing, and now I'm uh, talking uh, as an engineer, uh, that the a uh, Tesla car in a techno technology point of view is a traditional, I would like to say, old-fashioned car. What they did is they put 700 kilograms of batteries in a luxury car with more than two tons, 2.2 uh, or 2.5 tons. And this is not uh, what we have in mind when we are talking about sustainability. But they have a big market success. And why do they have this big market success? Because they did quite the opposite of the things which had been recommended by the politi uh, political level. The political level, they wanted to have small electric city cars in the lower segment. And Tesla did quite the opposite. And now the political level, they're talking um, to us and say, well, oh, why didn't you do this like a Tesla? <laughs> uh, so, um, but we are doing this. And we launched the European Green Vehicle Initiative I just mentioned. And the whole aut um, automotive sector in Europe is changing to electromobility. This will happen. There is no doubt about this. This will happen. Now we are in a transition period. And the important question is, when will it happen? How fast will it happen? And so on. Because we have to change our business. And at the moment, you, as a customer, you're not buying these cars. You're not buying these cars. But I'm quite sure you will buy these cars in the future because we are improving these cars. So we are working in the transition phase. Very good. I'm very glad we had this exchange because, as I said before, this will be absolutely crucial in Europe that we get this right. Um, so we open to the floor for very brief comments or questions. Um, I have to ask you to stay under one minute and uh, to, uh, to introduce yourself briefly. We go first to you, please. 
Microphone, very quickly, please. Where's the microphone? Don't we have a microphone? Okay, and then, uh, wait, wait, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And very, very quickly, please. Just, just on the question of value and how you create value, this is particularly to Stefan. Um, you mentioned the Tesla. What we're talking here is about user-centered design, the value that the consumer views. It's about the image of the product. It's about the, the dynamic, the, the feel that the customer gets in interacting with the product. As an engineer, how would you comment on that? Because one thing that Tesla does really well is project itself as something uh, uh, like Apple does, as an item of value in itself. It's design, it's flow, it's interaction with the user. It's much more than engineering. What are your observations on that? We'll take a couple. Thank you. Very good point user centricity. We had a gentleman back there. Please introduce yourself and ask a very quick question. And you need to run faster. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. I'm Jean-Jacques de Croft. Um, I wonder if there is not a, a huge disconnect here. Um, we talk about ecosystems and all these very interesting and complicated concepts. But what the entrepreneurs uh, are telling us through your survey yesterday, the testimony of a gentleman, is that we want less regulation. We want labor markets that are more flexible, less cumbersome, and so, so there, there seem to be low-hanging fruits that we, we, we don't uh, take advantage of. And shouldn't we focus on that first, and, and then also on ecosystems and nanotechnology, <laughs> et cetera? Thank you. It's, it's a valid point you're making uh, because uh, very few people would make the connection between innovation and regulation, uh, where regulation can actually also be an enabler of innovation. If you think about the GPS standard, which, is, uh, which was a regulation. Who else wants to go? The gentleman over there, in the, in, oh, you already have the microphone. Right. Very good, you're improving, thank you. Right. Go ahead. A brief comment. Uh, I don't think we're very far away from electrifying our cars already. My son told me a couple of months ago, his car is fine, but he's thinking about the next car. He did a calculation, which is almost surprising because he's not an engineer and he's not numbers oriented. He did a calculation, the higher uh, price of the original cost offsetting against the lower fuel costs. And he determined that with a certain amount of uh, kilometers per year, the electrical car is cheaper over its use time. His next car will be an electrical car. And I would guess he'll probably be in the market in a year or two. There are lots of others who, th this is not uh, a adequately conveyed to the customers. They see the higher original acquisition cost. Nobody bothers to tell them that their fuel costs are gonna be a lot lower. Electricity costs less than gasoline per watt delivered on the axles. Very good, thank you. Uh, before I go back to the panel, is there anyone in this room who actually has scaled up in Europe? Okay, um, I will let that speak for itself. No, I'm, I'm kidding, <laughs> you know. I'm yes, gonna go yes. back, I'm uh, gonna go back. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to go back <laughs> to, to the panel. I have to ask you to reflect on everything you heard. You won't be able to answer everything. Uh, just um, in one minute or less, you can respond to what you just heard. And then I'll come back to you one last time for, uh, yeah, I, I'll already tell you, you, I want you to make one recommendation in 20 seconds or less, so you can already start thinking about it. But now uh, we start with you, Stefan, very briefly. I completely agree, Tesla did a great job by creating this image and the image for the premium segment and Europe is strongly linked to the premium uh, segment is very um, um, Im important and we can learn uh, out of uh, this. Uh, I completely agree, image for premium for European cars is always important. Excellent, thank you. Jose. Yeah, actually, I, I do agree on the value. Um, one of the things that makes me worry is I don't like to live in a world in which you can pay for your groceries using an app, but we don't get a screen for cancer regularly. I don't like living in this world, actually. And the reason we live in that world is the way that we define the business case of the companies. We're always looking at black boxes, how much money you put in, how much money you get out, but not what, what is the cost 
of having a person only one day in a hospital instead of three months? What is the cost of a life? What is the cost of an early diagnostic of cancer? Why is not that added to a business plan? Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Deborah. I fully agree that uh, there is more to do in terms of regulation and uh, regula labor market regulation and business regulation is something uh, that uh, has to be tackled uh, and uh, I think it's part of uh, the strategies at the European level to try to do more uh, in, uh, in that uh, direction. I think it's, uh, it's actually very good uh, to complement uh, the two things. So do this and also do whatever we are hearing that is extremely interesting this, uh, in terms of creating ecosystem, etc. So complementing the two things. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so the, be the benefit of clusters of innovators is that you can very rapidly exchange a labor force in a particular company in order to meet the need. Uh, indeed, the success of Silicon Valley in many ways is because everyone is doing software and you can switch jobs in a matter of a day and find yourself useful to another company because of your talents. Enabling such rapid exchanges of ideas is really what leads to innovations. And if anything that hampers the ability for humans to exchange is indeed what's going to slow us down. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Before I let you go, uh, as was just said, I work for the president of the European Commission. When I go back to Brussels, um, what do you want me to say to him on scaling up? One recommendation, one thought, 20 seconds or less. We start with you, Stefan. Go on with the successful public-private partnerships. Jose. On the words of Carlos Moet. On the, on the words of Carlos Moedas yesterday, be techno-optimistic. We have a problem to solve, but we have a nice problem to solve. Very good, thank you. Deborah. I think uh, the, the whole issue on uh, skills and education and thinking about a uh, uh, stronger European intervention in terms of uh, uh, education, uh, something that is uh, more uh, also appealing on a European point of view. Also not on various Thank you. Vladimir. Uh, very simple. Develop a strong partnership with MIT. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't, mean to, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I now need to ask you to get off the stage very quickly uh, because uh, there is no break between now and the next session. And I ask uh, our moderator for the next session to please come up along with uh, the panelists. You know who you are. Quick, 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 or otherwise we're going to lose a lot of people in the room. Come